Please turn to the book of Joel, Joel chapter 1, and we will start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly God, we're so thankful we are here this morning. We are so thankful um, to be in your church, to be able to pray, to sing, to uh, study the word of God, to fellowship, and to join together. We look forward to the day when we can do that all the time, every day and every minute of the day with God's people. And we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will continue to lead this church in the right direction because we know, God, you will lead us in the way that we need to go and we ask for your guidance in doing that. Help us to be servants of God and to trust you in all things. In your name we pray, amen. Richard didn't ask me about who my superhero was, but my superhero is Jesus, amen? amen? All right, we just wanted to get that straight. He's the ultimate superhero. In the book of Joel, it gives the story of where there is this raging locust that goes throughout all of Judah, and it just eliminates and destroys everything. And in the book of Joel, unlike other prophecies, Joel is there when this happened. He is a prophet when it is going on and takes place. Unlike John, who talks about the things to come, even Jesus, who talks about the end and the destruction of Jerusalem and what will happen in the end days here, here Joel has experienced it, and he knows that he has to speak up on this here, because this is a disaster that is really, really bad. It affects all of the people, every one of them, in their fields, in their homes, in their lives, and everything. He starts out and says this in the first book of Joel, chapter one. He says, hear this, you elders, and give ear all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything, listen to this, has anything like this happened in your days? Has anyone asked you that question in the last year or so? Has anything like this happened in your days? And the people are, are confounded, they are confused, they're walking around not knowing exactly what to do. Or has this even happened in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. What the chewing locusts have left and Joel is very specific about going and telling detail by detail about what the locusts have done and what, what they have destroyed. He says that it was locust upon locust. Look how he puts it here in verse 4. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locusts have eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust have eaten. He says one and then another and then another. They all had their jobs, these locusts, and they worked like an army and they destroyed our crops and our land, everything, and they were very, very thorough. He says in verse 12, the vine has dried up and the fig tree has withered, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree. All the trees of the fields are withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. So just as everything of the trees and all has withered, so has the son of man withered too. That they're walking around, they're looking at their land, and, and they're saying, what are we going to do now? We don't even have anything to start up again with. What do we do now? And they're feeling helpless and hopeless. They're feeling like there's nothing for them. They feel a despair and a depression has come over them. They feel a sadness and they feel like they are withering themselves. What do we do? What do we do? Then all of a sudden you hear Joel, blow the trumpet in Zion, chapter two, and sound alarm in my holy mountain. Because as a good prophet of God, he knows this is an opportune time. This is the exact time to remember and remind the people who God is. 
Blow the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all, not just some, but let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. And what is interesting, as Joel writes this, there's going to be many days and many years after Joel. But remember, he is inspired by the Holy Spirit, he is inspired by God, and he is writing a message for those inhabitants of 2021. Uh, for us. That's the new, wonderful, unique thing about the Bible. And he says, the day of the Lord is coming. And he's grabbing the attention of the people. Stop looking at your withered fields. Stop looking at your withered vines. Uh, you know, your animals are, 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 are mooing out there and they're desperate and they don't know what to do because they don't have food to eat and they're not quite sure what's going on either. And he says, hey, for it is at hand. It is going to be a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. So what are you going to do? What are you going to cling to? What are you going to hold on to? You have nothing. You have nothing. You know, and it's the thing that when you feel you have nothing but Jesus, then that's what you know you have everything because you do have Jesus. Right? Because you do have Jesus. And Joel brings out this very clearly that, you know, you have to think about where you're at. Verse 3, he says, you know, it is a conquering en enemy that has come. A fire devours before them and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them and then like a wandering desert, a wandering wilderness. It took everything from you. It took everything. But it didn't take your relationship with God. It shouldn't take your faith away. It shouldn't take your belief away. It shouldn't take what has been built inside of you that nothing and no one can take away. And, you know, no matter what happens, you know, Satan can't take that away. People can't take that away from you. It is what you have to have is that strong faith and to lift yourself out of that depression, lift up yourself out of that misery because the Lord is strong. The Lord is strong. It says in verse 9, they, are, they run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb on the houses. They enter the windows like a thief. Talking about the locusts. He says you couldn't get rid of them. They were going everywhere. They were under your bed. They were in your closet and everything. I don't know if any of you have ever been in the Midwest when there's been a locust invasion. Anybody had an opportunity to have that happen in anywhere? No? Good for you. Okay. You know, it is a mess. Because you have locusts everywhere and, and you are having to get brooms and sweep them down and throw them out of the house and do what you can. Even a small containment of locusts here. And he says the enemy wants to seep in into every kernel, corner of our world. And that's how it is for us. Every corner of our world, the enemy wants to seep in. But we have God. And he won't let that happen for us. And even if it comes through, we have God. And even as we are discouraged and can't see, we have God. He tells us this. Verse 11, he says, The Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp, his camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, who can endure it? And who can endure it? But God's people. We can endure it. We know we can go through whatever happens anywhere and anytime, and we can endure it. We may be left without money. We may be left without cars and our clothes. You know, you can have it in a house fire, everything destroyed. You can have everything fall apart. You can have your family killed. You can have your family die. Whatever happens in terms of things like that, you could lose everything that seems so much of value to you. But the faith of God is one in which he stores in us this endurable quality that as we look towards Jesus, we'll get through it. We will get through it. No matter what it is, we will get through it. 
And it says the Lord gives voice before his army. He tells us that we are his example. We are his witnesses that we'll go on. We'll go on no matter what. And then he talks here about a call to repentance. And he says, this is a good time. When you have nothing and you see all that has been before you, this is the call to repentance, to ask forgiveness from God, to make sure that you are right with the Lord. He says, verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion again and consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babes, let the bridegroom, let the bridegroom go out from the chamber and the bride from her dressing room. And I imagine that what Joel did is that in the middle of a destroyed wheat field, he gathered the people. He said, let's gather together. Let's meet together. Because if we have nothing else, we have each other. And let's gather together a sacred assembly. Let's pray and let's sing songs and let's rejoice and let us be thankful that we have each other because we know our Lord will help us. No, he didn't stop the locusts. They came through Judah unstoppable, and it happened. But it would make the people of Judah a better people. It will help them to grow. And God says that's a, a, a definite part of the recipe of becoming a strong Christian is tribulation. You know that. And when you've gone through a hard time, you become stronger with it. It's not that all that hard. And so, so he tells us, return to the Lord. Let that bridegroom and that bride meet together and join. Let the priest, verse 17, who minister to the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage a reproach. So they have themselves and each other and God to cling to. And if that's all you have to cling to, brothers and sisters, believe it or not, when you've lost everything, it is still enough. God will help you rebuild. God will help you to reclaim. God will help you to restore. He can do that. There is nothing too strong, too much for the Lord he can do. He tells us not to rend your uh, garments, but rend your heart. He says, you know, you want to rend your garments, and you want to say, oh, Lord, how could this happen to me like that? He says, rend your hearts. Come to God and, tell, and plead for God and tell God, God, you, I need your help now more than anything. I need you to help me through this. And when we rend our hearts, something changes. We can become stronger. We can be supported and help others as we never are, have ever had. We, we soon learn not to be afraid, not to be afraid. God will be gracious and merciful. He will help us to come together, and the people will get together. That's a big deal. That in crisis, when it's bad, God's people are to come together, supporting each other, helping each other, talking to each other, praying together, doing all the things that we need to do. God's people were designed and made to be together. Gather a sacred assembly. Gather a sacred assembly. Pray together and be together. I saw this thing where uh, the people had had an earthquake and their homes are destroyed. And you know, they're walking down the streets of their neighborhood and this house is destroyed and this house is in rubble and this house is in rubble and everything is destroyed. And there was a set of people who had gathered together around in a circle and along with them firemen and policemen and they gathered and they all got down on their knees and they were praying and thanking God for his mercy and his grace and sparing their lives. What grace, what praise is that to God? He will restore and he will refresh them. He will do as he says he will. It goes on here in verse 20. But I will remove far from you the northern army and will drive him away into a barren and desolate land. 
with his face towards the eastern sea and his back towards the western sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. You know, when God's saying, I'm going to move that enemy away from you. I'm going to move that doubt. I'm going to move the uh, people who have made you feel discouraged and move all of those things away from you because he's going to be conquering everything. 21, fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Can everyone here say that the Lord has done marvelous things? Don, has God, God done marvelous things for you? Amen. You know, has God done marvelous things for you, Michael? Amen. Bob, has God done marvelous things for you? Amen. We are witness of that, that God has indeed done marvelous things. Do not be afraid. Verse 22, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up, and the trees bear its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. It'll all come back. It will all come back. And you'll be a glorifying God, and telling even that the animals will be able to <laughs> rejoice in their own way about having food again and having a good and, and plentiful pasture for them to eat out of. Verse 25 says to us, So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, and the chewing locusts. My great army which I sent among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. He teaches us that among disaster, among pain, and whether it's an individual pain, where you have lost someone to cancer, to COVID, in a car accident, that God has opened a door and given an open door for you to see a glimmer of light. And it's that way for everyone and everything. And the final reward is then that that door is going to be swung all the way open. Our final reward in heaven Okay, we live 60, 70 years here and have the misery of this earth the way it is. But there is a door that is open. John saw that door. He says, I saw the door open. I looked into heaven. Okay, because God wants us there and God wants us to be in heaven. And so there's always that to look forward to. And then uh, there's this famous quote that everyone knows. And then he says, then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am in the midst of Albuquerque. I am in the midst of New York City. I am in the midst of California. I am in the midst of all of us. I am in the midst of your home. I am in the midst of your life. I am the Lord of God and there is no other. My people shall never my people, look at this, my people shall never be put to shame. There won't be a, a, a situation where the people will say, why did you believe in your God? He has done nothing for you. Why do you believe in your God who has turned his heart away from you? It says, oh, my people will never be ashamed. They will be able to praise God. And he says here then, he comes here after all this, looking at the misery, looking at the pain, encouraging. And he says, but there's more. There's much more. Verse 28, chapter 2. And it shall come to pass afterward. Okay? It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. The day's coming. I think it's happening around the world already. The Holy Spirit is going upon all all flesh. And the reason it says all flesh is because there's God's people working in every nation, land, and people. And it's going to all flesh because there's people who need to know about God and who will be illuminated by the light of God. It says it's going to go to all flesh because that's the power of the Holy Spirit. It talks about the latter rain and the former rain. The former rain, you know, it comes in the spring to start those crops off, and then you have the harvest with the latter rain here, and it says now that Spirit of God will come to pass afterward, and that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and it says things will change. 
spiritually throughout this world, things will change. It'll be a noticeable change. A notable change. It says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesize. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. In other words, people will be touched by that Holy Spirit to tell others, he's coming soon. He's coming soon. Be ready. He's coming soon. Whether they receive it in prophecy, in vision, in dreams, or whatever way, he says that Holy Spirit will not be stopped. It will go throughout the whole nations of all over the world. There will be a Holy Spirit. There will be a time in this world where there will be chaos, havoc, and everything on one side, and there will be this Holy Spirit just dwelling in everywhere. And it's for us to receive that spirit, to have it poured out on all of us so that we can have that. And when we have it, we will look past politics. We will look past social norms. We will look past the bad news that is around us. We will look past all the disagreements that we have because we've got all focus, all center, because that spirit is poured out on all to give the final end time message to the world. And you can do all you want to get down to the understanding of the Antichrist and what's going to happen and then the change of governments and all of the things that are taking place and all that. You can do that and you can educate yourself well and prepare for, you, for all those things. But you're going to at one point have to look past all of that and do what God tells you to do. Go out there. Tell people that Jesus is coming soon to turn your hearts toward God, Amen. to believe in the one true God who's coming with thousands times 10,000 and thousands times 10,000 angels, and he's coming to proclaim his, his glory, and he's coming to bring, get his people and gather them together. That is going to be the social event of the year, folks. Hallelujah. Right? That's going to be it. No one's going to miss it. Not the people in China, not the people in Russia, not the people in, in Peru or Bolivia, not anybody anywhere. It's a glorious, glorious thing. And I will show wonders. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And you may be shaking in your boots, but if you have the faith that God has built inside of you and you work towards getting that faith, he says there, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord, and that doesn't mean in a casual, flippant way. You call on the name of the Lord, it means that in your heart, you made up your mind a long time ago to give it to God, to serve God, to do God, to obey God, to tell about God, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be what? shall be saved. Easy religious policy. Easy religious doctrine. There's no hiding behind that. You will either or you will not call on the name of the Lord. It's black and white. There's no in between. There's no left behind. Okay? Call on the name of the Lord, it shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Amen. And it's a remnant. We have to face the fact that out of all the billions of people that will have ever lived and existed in this world, the majority of them will be lost. The majority of them will not go to heaven. And that's kind of sad because that is the way the world has gone. But there will be a people that will be delivered among the remnant whom the Lord calls. There will be a people who will answer the call. And he brings out in this last chapter of the book of Joel where God judges the nation. He says in verse 7, Behold, I will raise them, 
one out of the place to which you have sold them, and will return your retaliation upon your own head. I will sell your sons and daughters into the hands of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off, for the Lord has spoken. There is a punishment. There is a judgment. It will happen. God says there must be the difference. There must be a cleansing of sin, and there must be a cleansing of sinners. It has to happen. They have got to be removed. They have got to be removed. And God indeed will judge the nations. And it will tell us here, verse 10, Beat your plowshares in the swords and your pruning hooks with spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. That beat your plows into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Can anyone remember when that was said in our nation's history? Maybe you can't remember. If you're 50 and older, you should remember this. Okay? But maybe you don't. But there was that agreement that Jimmy Carter had with Israel and uh, with the Palestinian nation to join them together. That somehow we can stop this war. We can stop this fighting in the Middle East and we can all of a sudden be friends and we won't have to fight and we have this Israel peace accord that we're going to have. Is it working? Is it working? There's still wars, there's still bloodshed. It's only Jesus, brothers and sisters. It's only Jesus that ends the conflict. It's only Jesus. But it says, let the weak say, I am strong. And you're strong because of who? Who are you strong by? I am, by God, by Jesus. I am weak, but he, he is strong. He is strong. And so it tells us that, yeah, there will be a time and it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine. The hills shall flow with milk and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. This is the last part there in Joel. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Arcadius. It tells us there will be a time when things will bloom again. Things will be refreshed and made new. And in our scripture today, of Isaiah 51, it gives us a, an enduring, enduring promise. It tells us here, so the ransom of the Lord shall return. I'm come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. When we go to heaven, we're going to see the streets of gold, but that's not it. We're going to see acres and acres of flowing beautiful grass, but that's not it. We're going to see mansions and homes beautiful, perfect areas to live in. But that's not it. We're going to see angels, ten thousands and thousands of angels. We're going to see other people from other worlds gathering around and looking at us as we enter into those gates. The redeem of the Lord, that's them. That's them. But what heaven is, above all of the glorious things that we will see with our eye, is that we will be in the presence of Jesus. That's all that really matters. We're in the presence of Jesus to where we can feel and see and absorb Jesus. Because that's what heaven is, Jesus. All those other things are great, and they're nice, they're okay, and we'll love to see all that. But it's Jesus above all things. Dear Lord, we ask you to help us to see Jesus now, to feel Jesus in his presence now. Let our hearts be turned to serving. Let our hearts be turned in a good way to doing good, 
to be thinking good of others, that the hate and the anger, and the resentment, the mistrust, let it melt away, Lord, and let it be replaced by goodness and honesty and love and compassion. We are a people that we are waiting for that trumpet to blow so that we can return to Zion. In your name we pray. Amen.